Well, Jared, it's Sabbath. Sabbath. So we can see your few five smiling faces. It looks like the Vespers. <laughs> Remember the last time it was this light. Well, I hope everybody's enjoying themselves in ASI. And... Okay, our little talk today. It's going to kind of coincide with the sad school lesson. This is low hanging fruit. This isn't something that's really difficult or deep theology. Okay. Um, the title of this little talk is God's Way is Singleness of Heart. Sound like an amen thing? Amen. All right. Beautiful. I like to hear that. Yes, it encourages me. Um, let us have another quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you have done everything that needs to be done. We're thankful that you had the perfect plan from the beginning, and, and although we don't see the end from the beginning as you do, we know this thing is going to unfold exactly as it's supposed to. And we're thankful that you have everything in hand. You didn't oversleep this morning. You didn't ever forget anything. We just need to trust you single focused. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. If you turn to Acts, which you're probably already there, chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 42. Chapter 2 and verse 42. And I have a little title over this scripture that says the devotion and increase of the infant church. Okay? How did that happen? It was pretty powerful back then, wasn't it? The church came in with bang, right? You reckon it might go out the same way? Okay. So maybe we can learn something by studying the first. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Kind of sounds like house church, doesn't it, maybe? A little bit. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. What kind of fear do you think we're talking about here? Grab that walker there, partner, behind you. Forgets the walker. Fear. What kind of fear are we thinking? Love of God. Love of God. Anything else? Awe. A profound reverence. An awe toward God. Sounds right, right? And all that believed were together and had all things common. That sounds like unity, doesn't it? Sounds like oneness. Harmony. You reckon that will be happening in the end? You think that may bring about what God is trying to accomplish here because on the one hand you have the accuser saying that these things can't be done right and God says oh yes they can and they will yeah. and it was modeled right here right by Jesus the disciples and apostles the first church, how, how quickly did that fire go? And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with what? One accord. One accord. It sounds like unity again, doesn't it? In the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Sounds like... They're just constant fellowship and worship. And 
and oneness, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And singleness of heart. There's something there, isn't there? Singleness of heart. That's what we really want to get after here today. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Alright, I want to turn to John. A bit left of where we are. John chapter 17. I believe that's the chapter of intercessory prayer, right? Okay, I'll get there to say amen. amen. All right. I want to begin in verse 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So this is Jesus speaking, right? It's red letters. It's his prayer. He wants us to have his joy fulfilled in us. Correct? Is it our desire? Because it's certainly Jesus' desire. That's the question. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. Jesus. Who's the Word? Jesus. So this, this sentence here is synonymous, right? It's G. You could just interplant them words with Jesus. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through, through the truth. Okay? We talked a little bit about justification and sanctification today in, in Sabbath school, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one. Do you hear the oneness all through here? Even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Are you hearing this? What is perfection? Huh? Mature God. God's looking for us to have this oneness. This is the perfection that He wants us to, to, to come to. And in Him, it's all possible. Right? And that the world may know that Thou hast sent me and hast loved them as Thou hast loved them. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. <coughs> For thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Does that sound wonderful? It does, doesn't it? What, what is the Old Testament? And what is the New Testament? Is there a difference? No? No? Okay. 
I've heard it said that the Old Testament is the New Testament veiled, and the New Testament is the Old Testament unveiled. Does that sound right? Sound good? Let us turn to Matthew chapter 6. I'd like to just let the Bible speak for itself. I don't have to uh, leave here, come here to hear my opinion. Matthew 6, and let's begin at verse 21. Okay? Matthew 6 and 21, you're all there to say amen. Amen. For where your treasure is, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Does this sound like singleness of heart? With what the what we're talking about here today? Let's go to verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? Mammon? Money? Anything else. Right? You can put anything in there. So God must be the single focus. Right? And all other things will be put to where they need to be. Because if, if God is where he should be, like he was with Jesus, Right? Jesus got his marching orders every every day, did he not? Every place he went was a divine appointment. Every person that he met, he was supposed to meet. You know, there wasn't anything by chance. Uh, my page flipped. Fan took it. But anyways, let's go to 30, verse 30. I'm jumping down there. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what whither shall we be clothed? Do you hear that? Does it sound like God saying, I got this? How many of us worry about it? all these trivial things. <laughs> all of us do, don't we? God is concerned about even these little things. So if we put first things first, we're singleness of heart, you think he'll take care of everything? I think so. I think everything will find its place. And here it is in verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God in his righteousness. Not righteousness in and of myself, but his righteousness. Because I seek ye first, right? And all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore take no thought of, for the morrow. For the, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Amen? Amen. Let us turn to Luke. Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 10. And I want to go to verse 38. And I want to maybe get some discussion on this too. If we uh, possibly will see how this goes here. Are you there? Okay, Luke chapter 10. And I got a heading above verse 38. I'm going to read it to you. In the home of Mary and Martha. Now, 
Now I'm starting in verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that they entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him <laughs> into her house. And she said, and she had a sister called Mary, which, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. What do you reckon, how would you like to have been Martha? I know we have Marthas and we have Marys. Think about that for a moment. She comes up, somebody's got to serve, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people got to eat. Things have to be done. Mary hath chosen the better part, and it won't be taken away from her. Did that seem cold-hearted of Jesus to say that to Martha? Do you think Martha was offended? Yeah. That, that, you know, we get people today are super offended. Offended by everything. You know, you get people that walk out of church because nobody smiled at me today. You know? And then let that ruin their day. Are we really? Go ahead. Is this the same Mary that had so many problems out there in the past? I mean, that she really had a lot of problems and probably needed to hear the Lord more maybe than Martha. Okay, there's an observation. Yes? I don't think he was berating Martha. I think he was explaining to Martha Mary. Yeah. Mary, Mary, Mary. Okay. He wasn't being rude to Martha. No, no, no. I'm not saying he was. You're, I hear you. I get it. It just... It may sound like that to somebody, right? Reading it over, and if you're a Martha, right? Which I know there's a Martha sitting right behind you. <laughs> and she, she might be bothered by that, right, Lynn? I mean, you are a Martha. I think Martha should have just said, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll sit right down here and listen to Jesus. And whenever they're done, then... Then we eat, right? Right. There you go. Very good thought. Very good thought. That's awesome. Mary uh, listened to Jesus and could take the words with her and, and they didn't have them what? in her mind where Martha was busy in the kitchen and didn't hear anything. So Mary was better off. Yeah. And let's face it, I mean, Jesus wasn't going to be around for very long, right? I mean, they had a limited time and then he was to serve the purpose that he came for and he was going away, right? But that's the, the real point here is the single focusedness. Single focusedness. Am I saying that right? Focusedness. I don't know. Is that even a word? I'm trying. <laughs> we had a school teacher back here. Single-mindedness. Single mindedness, single focus, single mindedness. Yeah, that's what we're after. Absolutely. So if that's done. The rest of it, it can wait, right? Or it'll be taken care of. I believe that's the that's where God's trying to get us to. I got. Uh, let's go to Mark. One, one, one book back. Mark chapter eight. And verse. 35 is where I'm going to begin. Are you there? Amen. You know. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life 
For my sake, in the Gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. What profiteth a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What should be the primary focus? You mean the whole world? <laughs> what happens when you look into the eyes of your maker? What do you see? Love? Okay. I don't know. Whenever you when you see Isaiah strolling in to heaven, right? He's like he's the man. I, I got this, right? What does he say the moment? Whoa. 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 Is me. So yeah, woe is me. Right? So what you see when you're truly looking at God is you. And for what you really are, because you're sized up in a second. How low you are. I'm how low we all are. Right? Because his majesty is beyond reckoning. Okay? Beyond understanding. You have angels in heaven that just continually go, holy, holy. I think because when they come up, they got to go back down. I lost the words. Yeah. It's beyond, I mean, we, we try to, we try to understand this stuff with the human mind. <clears throat> and we're just, we don't have it. There, there isn't words. There isn't Feelings or emotions or things that we have, we, we have nothing that we've even tasted yet. But the important part is the single mindedness, the single focus. Because when it's there, this is all sized up. You follow me? And you can walk the way you need to walk and go where you need to go and do what you need to do because it's not you. It's me. Right? I can, I can never ever really stop thinking about the end where you have the sheep and the goats and the goats say, well, I did this and I did that and I did all these things. I did. And Jesus says, I never knew you. I never knew you. And then what does he say to the sheep? <coughs> sheep, you did this, and you did that, and you did the other thing. And they go, when did we do any of this? Right? So what's the focus? Christ. Christ is the focus. Single-mindedness. I want to read you something. Um... This is really small in my Bible, and my eyes are not as good as they used to be, so give me a second here. Um, and this, I think, really seals the deal on how God doesn't... <laughs> Let me just read it first. Christ came to the earth as God in the guise of humanity. He ascended to heaven as the king of saints. His ascension was worthy of his exalted char character. He went as one mighty in battle, a conqueror, leading captivity captive. He was attended by the heavenly hosts amid shouts and acclamations of praise and celestial song. Only for a, mo only for a few moments could the disciples hear the angel's song? As their Lord descended, his hand outstretched in blessing, 
They heard not the greeting he received. All heaven united in his reception. His entrance was not vague. All heaven was honored by his presence. The seal of heaven had been fixed to Christ's, Christ's atonement. That's amazing, isn't it? And I only, I only read that to set the tone to what I'm fixing to read here now. In, in it's titled, Full Glory of Ascension Veiled. Okay? The most precious fact of the, of, to the disciples in the ascension of Jesus was that he went from them into heaven in the tangible form of their divine teacher. The disciples not only saw the Lord ascend, but they had the testimony of the angels that he had gone to occupy his Father's throne in heaven. The last remembrance that the disciples were to have of their Lord was the, was the sympathizing friend, the glorified Redeemer. Moses veiled his face to hide the glory of the law, which was reflected upon him. And the glory of Christ's ascension was veiled from human sight, the brightness of the heavenly escort, and the opening of the glorious gates of God to welcome him were not to be discerned by mortal eyes. Had the track of Christ to heaven been revealed to the disciples in all its inexpressible glory, they could not have endured the sight. Had they beheld the myriads of angels and heard the bursts of triumph from the battlements of heaven as the everlasting doors were lifted up, the contrast between that glory and their own lives in a world of trial would have been so great that they would hardly have been able to take up the burden of their earthly lives. You hear that? That would have ruined the purpose. Prepared to execute with courage and faithfulness the commission given them by the Savior, even the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, which was sent to them, would not have been properly appreciated, nor would it have strengthened their hearts sufficiently to bear reproach continually, imprisonment, and death if need be. Their senses were not to become so infatuated with the glories of heaven that they would lose sight of the character of Christ on earth, which they were to copy in themselves. They were to keep distinctly before their minds the beauty and majesty of his life, the perfect harmony of all his attributes, and the mysterious union of the divine and human in his nature. It was better that the earthly acquaintance of the disciples with their Savior should end in the, in the solemn, quiet, and sublime manner in which it did. His visible ascent from the world was in harmony with the meekness and quiet, and, and quiet of his life. I just want to read one more little thing here. It's just a couple sentences. Christ ascended to heaven bearing a sanctified, holy humanity. Did you hear that? He took this humanity with him into the heavenly courts and through, and through the eternal ages, praise God, he will bear it as the one who has redeemed every human being in the city of God. Can I get an amen? amen. Woo. What an amazing, amazing thing. It's going to work. We're out of time. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. You hear that? 
Nothing matters, brothers and sisters, but the soul. The soul. That's what God cares about. The souls of men. And I'm just going to wrap this up because i got like a ton more and we're going to just say, to conclude, one idea, one desire, one motive, live to his praise.